Yeah, so I'll go ahead and do a quick introduction for the people that will be watching on my YouTube. Uh, what we're going to be debating here is, is socialism preferable to capitalism or should we strive towards socialism? So I'm obviously taking the negative on that and uh, Turn Leftist Podcast is taking the positive on that. So we're going to do opening statements. Um, I guess I'll do mine first uh, and then he'll do his. The opening statements are just presenting our cases, so they're not responding to each other yet. After that, then we can have an open discussion and we can go on for like an hour or so. And if we have closing statements, we want to go over. I didn't prepare a closing statement, but, you know, we'll just give our closing thoughts at the uh, end of the debate. So I'll go ahead and get my uh, opening statement ready right here. All right. All right. So my presentation is socialism slash communism is bad for real. All right. So what's most important is what even is socialism or communism? Uh, this is a rough question to answer because communists and socialists can't really seem to agree. If you ask five communists or five socialists what these words mean, you'll get seven different answers. Um, we also know that communism and socialism are sometimes interchangeable. Some people say, oh, I'm a socialist, but I'm against communism or vice versa. So it's it's it can be a bit complex and a lot of nuance is required. But there are some common tendencies for communist and socialist. Number one is the abolition of private property. So if you have a Marxist Leninist or if you have a market socialist, uh, individualist anarchist, they're really going to be striving towards the abolition of private property no matter where they stand. All right. They also have opposition to wage labor that kind of ties into it. And they have a desire for economic equality. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, I need to move my head so I can read this. He says, socialism by no means an invention of 19th century Marxism, but much older, must be conceptualized as an institutionalized interference with or aggression against private property and private property claims. Capitalism, on the other hand, is a social system based on the explicit recognition of private property and of non-aggressive contractual exchanges between private property owners. So that's kind of the definitions that I'm operating on, and I think they're pretty fair. We established that socialism abolishes private property, so this brings us to socialism's fatal flaw. Without private property and the means of production, there will be no market for the means of production. Without a market for the means of production, there will be no monetary prices established for the means of production. Without monetary prices reflecting the relative scarcity of capital goods, economic decision makers will be unable to rationally calculate the alternative use of capital goods. And uh, you can read more about this in Ludwig von Mises' essay, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. So we have a few examples of socialism in history. You know, uh, either people striving towards the abolition of private property or outright abolishing private property. So socialism in Chile is one example. We have Salvador Allende. He came into power in 1970 through an election. Uh, I've noted his campaign was funded by the KGB. So... You know, we can talk about whether or not that was legitimate Based. to go to happen in a democratic election. So what he did after he was elected was he nationalized some industries. He nationalized copper, healthcare, and 1,500 farms. He allowed armed Marxist militias to roam free and threaten or even kill civilians. Specifically, this which, was targeted which at, civilians uh, exactly though? Uh, I'll, I'll get. Hey, this is just yeah. the opening statement. I'll, I promise I'll like try to elaborate no, I, 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 on my sources. Um, allowed. So this is specifically targeted at business owners. Uh, okay. Destroyed freedom of speech, sanctioning media, jailing journalists, closing newspapers and radio stations, arrested and tortured political opponents. And basically, he gave Pinochet power. He appointed Pinochet and he built Pinochet's dictatorship. And so all of this comes from the uh, document, the Declaration of the Breakdown of Chile's Democracy, which came from um, the uh, Chamber of Chile, which is basically their equivalent to our House of Representatives. This was in 1973, uh, several weeks before the coup. So the results of socialism in Chile was a hundred was 1,000 percent plus inflation rates, an unprecedented decline in production, shortages in basic commodities, mass protests and strikes, and a massive decline in real wages. So you can read more about these specific effects in uh, socialist economist Alec Nov's book, Socialism, Economics and Development. Um, Sebastian S Sebastian Edwards also has a few papers on this. Um, one of them is called Macroeconomic Populism in Latin America. Um, and then also some of this is documented in the Declaration of the Breakdown of Chile's Democracy. And right here we have um, real wages in Chile. The orange lines represent uh, Allende's presidency. So we see a massive decline of roughly 70%, um, pretty major. 
then we have socialism in Burma, which is something not talked about often. Um, I spent a month in Burma back in 2017. So this is something that's very close to me. Um, so uh, the socialist leader, sorry, I forget his name. I think it's exact second. Um, he overthrew the democratically elected pre uh, prime minister in 1960 through 1962 in a coup. He started the Burmese way to socialism. So this lasted from 62 to 88. They established a Soviet style planned economy complete with five-year plans. Uh, they nationalized all major industries, import expert trade, rice, banking, newspapers, mining, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they seized 15,000 private firms and chased out foreign capitalists. So this mostly included um, Indians and, cap and Chinese. The result of this was they severely stunted economic growth. They had a massive black market, um, which accounted for 80% of the national economy. They built massive foreign debt, restricted freedom of speech, and wiped out millions in savings belonging to the Burmese people. Um, this led to the... Uh, 888 uprising which you can you can look that up who was uh i'll ask about that one later sorry yeah uh next we get to war communism in russia so uh lenin established that production should be run by the state private ownership should be kept to the minimum private houses were to be confiscated by the state state control was granted over the labor of every citizen and they had extreme centralization the result of this was the number of factories and mines, the number of workers in factories and mines dropped by 50%. Production in large factories dropped by 82%. The average worker productivity dropped by 44%. 90 percent of wages were paid in goods rather than money. Uh, grain harvest was cut almost in half, and there was mass starvation and disease. So um, after that, of course, they switched to the new economic policy for a number of years, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, but then you had the uh, sort of reverting back too close to what war communism was when Stalin came into power with the five-year plans and such. So he collectivized agriculture. They had what I'm going to call slave labor in the prisons, uh, which was a very important part of industrialization. They had unrealistic quotas, and they had their brief partnership with the Nazis. This resulted in the Holodomor genocide. Uh, simultaneous labor shortages and surpluses, which means some areas had shortages, some areas had surpluses, which just kind of shows uh, how terrible they were at allocating capital goods or, uh, or inputs. Dead food shortages, ecological disaster, mass repression, no freedom of speech, slower growth, and uh, massive losses in World War II as a result of their inferior economic system. All right, so now we get to some of the evidence on uh, the Soviet Union under Stalin. There's a great paper by several uh, uh, Russian economists a few years back, National Bureau of Economic Research working paper 19425. Uh, it's called, Was Stalin Necessary for Russia's Economic Development? There's also a book by uh, socialist economist Alec Nov called Was Stalin Necessary, I believe, which kind of has the uh, same concept. So what these guys did is they... Uh, establish what's called a synthetic control analysis in which they take kind of different parts of other economies or other data we have to create as much of an accurate counterfactual as we possibly can. This is a relatively new thing in economics and in science in general. Um, it's really good uh, because it helps us establish as many controls as possible so we can actually get, we can actually make accurate predictions. Um, so they're Conclusion was, was Stalin necessary for Russia's economic development? In short, our answer is a definitive no. A SARS economy, even our conservative version, assuming that it would not experience any, any decline in frictions, would have achieved a rather similar structure of the economy and levels of production as Stalin's economy in 1940. Uh, there was a similar analysis done by Jose Fernandez de la Punte in his book, Back to, Back to the USSR. Um, he says, given the above analysis, I conclude that Stalinism managed to grow GDP faster than Tsarist Russia, but the prices in terms of welfare to pay for the growth was not worth it. Liberalizing reforms in Tsarist Russia would have probably led to even faster growth. Um, from the book, The Penguin History of Modern Russia, I promise I'm wrapping up soon. Penguin History of Modern Russia by uh, historian Robert Service. He says, the human cost of Stalin's industrial strategy had been a had been huge throughout the 1930s. 
deaths occurred in their millions, the diet and health of the surviving population was poor, and popular hostility to the government had been intensified. Nor can it be wholly discounted that the USSR would have been able to achieve about the same volume of output from its factories and mines if the new economic policy had been maintained. So I definitely uh, don't prefer the new economic policy over a free market, but it was far more preferable than uh, Stalin's central planning or war communism. From uh, Collapse of an Empire by uh, Yegor Gator, I, I, I believe he was a, a Soviet economist. And he he, he, he might have been prime minister at one point the use of raw materials and energy in the production of i should clarify now i'm kind of getting to the uh, ecological disaster part i mentioned the use of raw materials and energy in the production of each final product was respectively 1.6 and 2.1 times greater than in the united states and he goes on to point out you know specific inputs where they had to use far more of these inputs to essentially reach the same outputs um, because of a uh, a lack of efficient allocation of resources and this is what leads to um, what is documented in the book, Ecocide in the USSR, right? So wasting a ton of inputs isn't good for the environment. You're, you're uh, having to harvest more materials for the same outputs. It's not good. All right. And there, there are many other, other issues. So Ecocide in the USSR documents basically the USSR being the worst ecological disaster in the history of mankind. And they say, for the environment, the central planning system became Frankenstein's monster. Without a market mechanism to determine the value of credit, goods, and services, they assigned arbitrary costs and prices to capital, labor, raw materials, and equipment. And so this is kind of the same argument that I presented at the beginning, but rather than this being from libertarian economists, this is from two left-wing journalists. So they were just able to establish this exact same argument, just making observations. They didn't go and read Mises. They didn't do any of that. They just observe this happening. Um, and now we're going to get a little bit further into the overall effects of communism or socialism. Um, this uh, New York Post headline reads, science proves communism makes nations poor and less healthy. So this is citing this paper um, in the peer review, peer review journal opens. Royal Society Open Science. Um, the paper is called Deep Cultural Ancestry and Human Development. Indic indicators across nation states. And so what they do is they have multiple variables accounted for, including geography, which is a really underrated variable when it comes to um, economic comparisons. Um, and they also have comparisons in um, ancestry and different religions. And so what you find is communism as a variable is significantly negatively associated to HDI, income index and health index. So this looks at um, 44 Eurasian countries. So this is mostly like countries that were part of the uh, Soviet bloc, of course. Uh, this paper, the economic calcul the economic consequences of durable left populist re regimes in Latin America is another synthetic control analysis. Um, in this one, they're looking at Venezuela, Nicaragua, Nic Nicaragua. Bolivia and Ecuador. And what they find is on average, these regimes reduced real per capita incomes by over 20%. And they speculate, you know, maybe people will say, oh, well, there's trade-offs, right? Like, like um, less inequality or better health. But they go on to say, we find no evidence of such a trade-off on average, as the average performance of these regimes on infant mortality and inequality did not significantly differ from the predictions of the average synthetic control counterfactual. And there's a very similar study to this, except it looks at liberalization, uh, mostly in Latin America and Africa. So they're looking at um, five case studies in Asia, five in Latin America, and 16 in Africa, and four in the Middle East and North Africa. We find that economic liberalization, as presented in the Sachs Warner indicator, tends to have by and large a positive or at least non-negative impact on the trajectory of real income per capita. So they're basically finding the opposite effects when you liberalize rather than go more towards a socialist system. I think this is the last one. I, yep, this is the last one I have. So this is a literature review of um, over 200 studies, uh, specifically 198 and they look at associations between outcomes and 
secure property or private property, freer trade, more stable money and prices, and less government spending and fewer regulations. Over two-thirds of the studies, which is 134 out of 198, found economic freedom corresponding to a good outcome such as faster growth, better living standards, more happiness, etc. Only eight papers, which is less than 4% of the sample, found economic freedom was associated with bad outcomes such as increased income inequality. So that's it. Um, I think the overall evidence shows us that communism or socialism leads to bad outcomes, and the opposite is true when it comes to free markets. Yeah, it's cool. Um, sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, an impressive set of slides. Uh, I can see, like, that's usually the style of your channel, right, is to present, like, a lot of data like that. Yeah. Make an argument that way. And I, I, we don't have to get to all of that. Um, no, that's fine. I mean, I'm glad you did that because... Things. We could literally go through all of those again, like one at a time, and I can give you like my initial responses to them. And I'm sure they would spur plenty of discussion. Um, I guess in by way of an opening statement, since I didn't prepare anything even close to that, um, I guess my overall response to it is that I'm familiar with like most of the, the arguments that you're making, not a lot of the uh, the graphs that you had towards the end there. And uh, I, I'm familiar with them a lot. And that's why I was saying before we before you gave your statement, I think a lot of it is going to come down to what our definitions are, where we set the definitions of things, like what countries we're defining as communist versus socialist, uh, what we even are. I, so that's, again, a lot of the territory I run into with Zulu, I find, as well. Um, so, yeah, it's... I, another thing, is, I guess, is a matter of goalposts. Like, I wanted to see, like, what metrics we're going to use to measure, like, what is more materially beneficial to people. And I noticed you started to address that, too. Like, my general idea of how those arguments tend to go is that the people on the right tend to cite examples of, like you said, economic freedom or economic, um, what do you call it? It's like liberty. It's always like, because it's usually not social mobility. It's usually not income equality. And it's usually not, uh, we, like, what I would call quality of life material measures, like your returns on what you spend for healthcare as opposed to the cost or free time that you have. It's usually things like how many consumer goods are you able to buy? Because that is usually what capitalism, even us Marxists will admit, it excels at. And what usually has to happen to make the case for that is to ignore what the trade-off is. And I know, like you said, you mentioned that in one of your last slides, but there's usually something it's usually just a matter of me asking enough questions until we get to where the hidden exploited labor force is. Maybe it's in like the prison, the for-profit prison complex. Maybe it's in like another country entirely and it's like sweatshop labor. But usually in capitalist countries, that is the case is that this supposed free market explosion of growth and civility and profits is predicated on that. And so it's usually a matter of finding where that is. And then I'm trying to think, what else did you have in there? I mean, if you want to go back, we can go through some of those because I think you had a lot of really good things that will spur some discussion. Because, like, yeah, and I, I can make some points on some of the things you said. Like, yeah, I definitely wanted to try to understand you guys as much as possible. And from anyone who knows my content, they know I really hone in on Marxist Leninists. So that means I, I watch a lot of stuff. I watch Hakeem, I watch all the other guys whose names I can't pronounce <laughs> on, on, um, on YouTube, the different Marx Leninists, second thought, people like mm. that, right? So I'm, I'm very familiar with the literature. I go and read your guys's um, research, Google Docs and stuff like that, Reddit threads, all those things. So yeah, I wanted to present. Can I make like a couple would... quick recommendations? Sure. Two of my favorites lately have been Ben Norton uh, with his uh, Multipolarista show, and then um, Brian Becker with his The Socialist Program. And both of them have very similar messages, but. They do a much better job of having like real professional historians and economists on to explain the kind of thing that I'm going to roughly say here tonight, because that's mostly where I'm getting a lot of my narrative for all this. So but go ahead. Yeah, I'm definitely familiar with Ben Norton. So, yeah, that's why I wanted to go into detail. And I'm trying to mostly label the ones as the country's socialist or, or communist as ones that you would label as those things. Mm -hmm. So like in the paper that looks at the. um the communism that's all eastern bloc countries right so i think i think is as a marxist leninist you consider those to be communist and or socialist um for the most part yeah and yeah yeah the, the, there are definitely things like income inequality that we we saw like sort of standing out in two different instances one was when they looked in the um the synthetic control on Latin America and they wanted to see okay well is this a trade off in this case in that case they said it, it wasn't but in the larger thing of 
looking at a bunch of studies, they said it was a trade-off. Um, now, I personally, I don't think it is a trade-off. I think the last one was wrong, um, and, but we can get into that a little later. So yeah, you said you wanted me to pull this up and I can show you some of these again. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those had a lot of really great, at least jumping off points that we could delve deeper into. Here we go. All right, well, we'll go back to the beginning and then you can just, well, we have, yeah. So if you want to start at the the different sources I gave, it sort of starts at the was solid necessary paper. Uh, Go back even further. Like what was your, what was your first slide? Okay. Let's see. So you want to start here? So, okay. So then uh, some of this was even news to me. Uh, came, came into power in 1970 through an election. Sounds good. Campaign funded by the KGB. I would concede that 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 is news to me, but I would be like, yeah, I think even yeah, based. That's fine. Um, nationalized copper healthcare, fifteen hundred farms, cool. Allowed armed Marxist militias to roam free and threaten or even kill civilians. So that was where I would like it pricks up my ears because it makes me wonder who are these civilians exactly? Is it people who are organizing with the right? Is it people who are supposed, uh, you know, even free speech warriors, but then the, you come to find out, find out they're actually working with the CIA or some kind of U.S. intelligence service. It's like, I, I think I say a lot on my show is that we tend to see very familiar patterns in a lot of these socialist countries and things that cause them to, quote unquote, fall apart or not succeed or whatever. And a lot of it happens to involve the CIA. And that's kind of what makes us sound like crazy conspiracy theorists because of how much the CIA has done this kind of thing and how prevalent it is. And then we keep acting like they're this boogeyman when in reality they just have controlled a lot of the fates of socialist countries for the last 50 60 70 years i mean pretty much since the end of world war ii but um so yeah, i mean uh, that, that kind of applies to i mean just real quick that applies to all the other points as well it's like when you say there's a destroyed freedom of speech a lot of times that involves closing newspapers that are like radio free x or y country which is like just a, an obvious arm of the cia jailing journalists again like tend to be people who are who have a reactionary message and are like counter-revolutionaries and tortured political opponents it's like yeah and then i guess the last thing and i'll let you explain this too is gave pinochet power because from my understanding i thought that was the result of the cia and the chicago boys that pinochet came to power to begin with like allende's last words were that he was you know going to be burned alive in like uh the embassy or whatever because of the the Pinochet coup, but I, if I'm if I'm mistaken about all that, please enlighten yeah, me. Yeah, sure. So in regarding re regarding the CIA, um, I do recognize that there's obviously CIA interference in a lot of these different instances. Uh, they mm -hmm. kind of get around everywhere. Um, I think it's overblown some of the time. Sometimes it's not. Uh, I think this is a case where it is entirely overblown. Um, so when I destroying freedom of speech, yeah, I mean we don't have specific evidence on what every single one of these instances were but i mean i would i would argue like, even if they are closing like radio free europe papers or, or, or radio free chile whatever it, stuff like that that's still a violation of free speech i know you from our last debate we saw that you kind of disagree in some of those areas um but you know i still consider that to be freedom of speech i think allowing political dissent to you know kind of present their side is something that's very important in a free society mm -hmm. um so when I say he gave Pinochet power, what a lot of people don't know is Allende really wanted a dictatorship and he went like hardcore because, you know, they, they don't have many years in power. I think it's uh, I think it was six years at the time. And he wanted to like completely turn the country into a communist country and uh, as fast as he could. But he, he kind of even though he was elected, he went hardcore trying to turn the country into a dictatorship. So this is why the. Um, declaration of the breakdown of chile's democracy happened and why you know the the representatives are like oh hold on we need to we need to kind of reconsider what's happening here because he was going behind the uh, he was violating the constitution he wasn't putting things through the representatives you know and these are supposed to be the democratically elected representatives so you'd think that if someone's trying to establish a a democratic marxist state then they would actually go through those people or they would at least listen to the the populace which he wasn't because they were starting strikes they were protesting and this is why the coup happened the coup didn't happen because of the cia now this the america did want a coup to happen but 
that's not saying much because they, they want coups to happen a lot. You know, they're just kind of like, you know, it would be great if a coup would happen. Sometimes they do something about that. Sometimes they don't. In this case, they didn't do anything about mm-hmm. that per se. Now, there, there was economic embargoes, but the effects of those ended up being pretty mute because the Soviet Union just came in and provided a bunch of credit and aid to Chile. Like we're talking billions of dollars. Um, at one point, they were even sending a whole ship full of tanks and and various weapons over. And that was actually when the coup happened. And then they had to like revert the uh, the ship because mm. like, oh, yeah, our guy's gone. Um, and they were they were also like bribing him specifically to do things for them. So, yeah, so he was so when I say he gave he built Pinochet's dictatorship, I'm saying he established the dictatorship and Pinochet literally utilized this entire system that Allende built. And that's where his dictator ca- dictatorship came from. He didn't start a dictatorship. He was a dictator, but he just continued a dictatorship. Uh, initially, he kept a lot of Allende's economic policies until 75. And that's when um, he started the uh, free market reforms. So I would say the CIA did not cause the coup. Um, the most I've seen that they did is they gave funding to some of the groups that were striking. Um, and some people say, oh, well, yeah, so all the strikings and economic problems happened because of the CIA. But the thing is, like these these labor unions and these strikers, they actually went to the CIA and asked for the funding. So they didn't incur. They didn't like start the strikes. The strikes just con- were able to continue and not forced into stopping because they got funding from the U.S. Interesting. Interesting. So those are interesting takes on those. I would say that. Uh... I think there's not much disagreement between our takes on the events and more so our interpretation of them. Uh, I, I'll, although I would contest the CIA not being involved. I think the CIA would be much more involved. I just am not particularly well read on Allende or Chile in that time period. I've like talked about it briefly and I've read some articles and everything, but just to get a, a broad overview, which I pretty much described already, but um, regarding things like Operation Gladio, like that's something that we have talked about more often. And that kind of is the CIA's MO of doing these kind of things is to fund usually far right groups and make it look like just what do you call it? Grassroots national sentiment or whatever that is uprooting the, the regime, the quote unquote regime that's in power. And again, like I say, it's just a very familiar pattern that we see over and over again. I'm also perfectly fine just saying that we will have to agree to disagree on like our interpretations of the events in Chile, because again, I mean, it's something I could just read up on and then come back to at some other point. But I would be more interested to see, like, what was the Chicago boys involvement in this? Um, Exactly what were the freedom of speech and medias that they were silencing and the specific journalists and newspapers and everything? Because, yeah, like I said, when it comes down to our interpretation, it's like you may say that even if these are obviously directly U.S. intelligence funded newspapers and journalists, they should still be allowed their freedom of speech. And yeah, I'm just never going to agree with that. I'm just never going to agree that any socialist country should allow that to happen in their country if they want even even the chance at a successful socialist project. And yeah, I don't know. That doesn't seem like an outlandish thing to me, especially if you just like flip it and say like, should the U.S. allow like I don't know like an openly Chinese communist and subversive uh, media? It's like the U.S. media blocks far more benign things than that. Like all of RT is gone. And I don't even think that was anywhere near as, what would you call it? Like counterculture is like something like these uh, journalists would be in any socialist country when they're sponsored by the U.S. intelligence. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. does allow that sort of thing to happen. Um, it's mostly Russia, actually, though. Um, I, I, I'm not, I can't recall any specific cases of China, but with Russia... You know, of course, you have RT, but RT isn't like a. It is. It's not like a Marxist organization. Yeah, but that's, but, so- but like I said, that's blocked in the U.S. now. Ever since the beginning oh, of the Russian, it? it has been since like February. But also, even if that's the case, even that. if RT was still here, there's some like China Daily or CGTN or whatever you could have access to in the U.S. What foreign media outlet is like openly calling for regime change in the U.S. Like grassroots. <laughs> Bottom. Well, any any Marxist group is essentially calling for that. All right, any Marxist group is calling for either violently or democratically changing, you know, the, the leader, the the entire leadership, really, you know, and changing the entire system. Um, yeah, I mean, but the, the only people I know of who actively use that language are like the Revcoms, 
and even they are sort of interpreted in like a it's almost like they, people still just consider it like a theoretical thing it's it's weird yeah you have like soapbox which is basically run by marxist leninists but mm -hmm. they get all their funding from um organizations owned by the russian government and you know they're, they're like openly marxist and m I don't think the Russian government is Marxist, but I think they're willing to fund Marxist groups or Marxist mm. organizations in the U.S. because they believe that kind of undermines the U.S. Because I think, you know, they're kind of looking at, as, at the perspective of, oh, you know, we're against what the Marxists did in our past. And so we want to do the we want the Marxists to do the same thing to the U.S. because the U.S. Now is that's a enemy. That's a good that's a hot take. I like that take. I mean, because I was very with you. Up until that very last line when you were saying, because I think that that's very much the case. Like, I catch a lot of shit for not taking the mainstream line on the Ukraine invasion or, quote unquote, supporting Russia or Putin in certain things. And I don't think that Putin is at all a good guy or Russia has good aims. It's just that a lot of their things that will motivate them selfishly are also in the interest of Marxist Leninists. And I mean, that may just be because of the complete ideological contradictions between Marxism, Leninism and capitalism, which runs the U.S. And so doing good things for Marxist Leninists in the U.S. does help them achieve their goals as far as like destabilizing their main enemy, I suppose. So that is interesting. I like that. But I don't know if um, I don't know if Putin's doing that because he thinks that Marxism, Leninism is just a a, cent a inherently destabilizing thing for any country and therefore is using it to his advantage in that way, like. I feel like they probably realize that um, it helps build up the, the at least the sentiment for anti-U.S. hegemony and anti-U.S. imperialism, which is huge. But I mean, we can move on from the socialism in Chile side if you want to go to like one of the other ones. Yeah, I think a lot of Marxist Leninists and even libertarians kind of like kissing the toes of Russia because they have a lot of critiques of American geopolitics, which is valid. They do. They have a lot of valid critiques of American geopolitics, and that's fine. But, you know, we have to remember they have their own problems in geopolitics and they have their own domestic problems as well. Um, so, true. yeah, what you said is uh, is right there. A uh, thousand um, percent inflation rates, unprecedented decline in production, shortages of basic commodities. Again, these are all like statistics that I have not looked into in depth, but I would just concede them for the sake of argument and say that when it comes to pretty much any socialist project in the past or even in the present, us Marxists are more than happy to acknowledge the failures and say that those were mistakes that they should be learned from, not things that should be repeated, especially if they were a result of like some kind of dogmatic policy as opposed to adapting Marxism to real life current material conditions. So that's usually my response in general for these kind of things. I, I understand like the, you know, selecting different uh, stats and uh, yeah, it makes for good content, but that's usually our response. Like, again, I'll probably end up citing china for the most part as like the most modern and relevant example of a successful socialist project and like all of their recent developments in the last 20 to 30 years um yeah if you want to look at this stuff one. if you want to look at like the failures of chile's policies under allende from a socialist perspective the the book i mentioned socialism economics and development by alec nove you might you may or may not be familiar to with him because he's written a lot of economic history books about the Soviet Union, which this one actually goes into. But the first couple of chapters are about Allende. And he sort of starts off, actually, let's see here. He starts off like saying, to pretend that the government merely fell victim to a conspiracy between the CIA and the extreme right is of no help to anyone. And he he goes on to actually like go over all the data and stuff. And he's, you know, he's a socialist. He, he wants a socialist state. But he's mm -hmm. like, I think we need we need to be realistic about this. We need to not spread disinformation about this and just see like, yeah, these policies did fail and we can do better. Um, and, you know, he has his own view on how to do a better version of socialism, which, of course, I disagree with. But his critiques of of socialism in Chile are definitely really good. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a huge thing, especially amongst us Marxists, is there's also tons of splits. He could very well be just a slightly different tendency than you know, the, the groups I hang out and he could be like a Trotskyist and be coming at it from that angle or something. So yeah, that's yeah, definitely he's more of a market socialist. Oh, okay. Yeah. That would explain a lot too. But yeah, I mean, I think um, in general, we're perfectly happy to acknowledge, like I said, the failings and uh, missteps of previous socialist projects and use those as things to learn from. And I would actually say that I would make the claim that that's an advantage of socialism as opposed to capitalism, because if you have a democratic controlled system, and it has actual levers of the means of production within its purview. It's like 
then you have the ability to correct those mistakes much faster. It's like the easiest example for me is climate change. It's like we're living through an unprecedented mass extinction event and we're seeing like increased weather, like um, what do you call it? Severity and uh, natural disasters increasing in uh, frequency. And so we're seeing like the real time effects of climate change. And not only do we not have the ability to even stop the the carbon emissions that would prevent it from getting worse, like we can't even yeah, we can't even slow them down. We can't even stop them from just continuing at full speed, knowing very well that it's going to very likely end humanity or make the, the entire planet uninhabitable. It's like, for me, that's like usually the home run argument when it comes to capitalism being materially worse is that in the, I don't know, four or five centuries that industrial capitalism has really taken off, it made a planet that was perfectly habitable, uninhabitable, and put like microplastics in breast milk or whatever tea fowl put in the water with the um those forever chemicals then the uh the non-stick stuff i know we did an episode about that too so i'm going off on a rant here i don't know if you have any response to any of that stuff yeah yeah um i'm not gonna go on everything but like when you said in socialism people learn from mistakes i would definitely disagree with that i i, I think there's some instances where they kind of try it sort of uh in, in government but fundamentally there's really no good way to kind of rapidly um fix those mistakes right because everything is centralized i think that makes it much more difficult right it's, it's central planning it's called central planning for a reason so when you have a, the decentralized system or like the anarchy of production which i, I i'm kind of use, doing a tongue-in-cheek thing there, kind of using it anarchy in a, not in the term of chaos but you know decentralized the anarchy of production you have individual individual firms that fail right and other firms can learn from them that's that's actually a very important function of capitalism when you have a firm that fails it's not really always a net negative because other firms around them and firms that don't even exist yet will learn from the failures of these firms and they can do better in the future they can do better for themselves and do better for consumers and an analogy i like to use is let's say you have an entire country where everybody's drinking let's say grape juice for, for the, I, I don't drink alcohol. So let's say grape juice. Um, everybody drinks grape juice and they love grape, grape juice. In this country, you have one plant where you make grape juice and it's, it's run by, you know, the, the central government, right? If you have some sort of corruption in this case, let's say poison or, or, or disease or something that gets into the grape juice, then that's spread everywhere, right? You have everything in one place. And so everybody is affected by that. But if rather than that, you have a decentralized system where, you know, some areas all get their grape juice from from one factory. Some people can start their own grape juice production. Some people import grape juice from other countries. Then if this disease or this corruption happens in one plant, only the some are affected by it, not everybody. So I think that's a very important uh, that's a that's a hypothetical that kind of shows how corruption is worse when you have a centralized system when you have a uh, central planning now for for well, can i can i respond to your hypothetical sure i like when you guys have to use hypotheticals because that just it's very entertaining to me but um like in reality central planning actually allows countries or an entire economy to adapt to conditions to changing conditions very quickly and like i'll use the example from my understanding china was able to weather the 2008 economic crisis much better than the US because they were able to overnight shift their economy from production for the purposes of foreign consumption and just basically reorient it toward domestic production. And so they were less dependent on selling goods to foreign countries, knowing that other countries were going to go through a slump and their sales were going to dip as a result, and then shifted more towards economic production for domestic goods. And that allowed them to not have the similar kind of recession that many people would argue the U.S. is still suffering the effects of and that like the working class people have not actually recovered from and that the recovery that's gone on in the U.S. since then has been concentrated in the hands of the wealthy. And again, it's that capitalist juking of the stats to make it look like it's been beneficial for everyone. But again, more towards the example of your hypothetical, I think it's silly to assume that in a centralized economy that all the grapefruit juice production would happen in one place when in reality, even in a centrally planned economy, you have something like in China where their grapefruit juice may be produced in several different places, but maybe the price is managed centrally. And even that is not the case because they still have markets at lower levels. It's 
when they get to like essential goods um like yeah uh, but it's, it's not meant to be like literally grape juice right we're just sort of giving an example like it's right but th of course that example like you can't have multiple of course you can't have multiple grape juice factors right i'm just talking about like the like economic planning in of itself right not yeah, what i mean is even not in your commodity example, production you use like a tainted product essentially planned economies that don't put the profit motive over people's health are able to respond to those things better, which is why we see things like Johnson and Johnson leaving asbestos in their baby powder for decades, knowing about it, or what happened with cigarette companies, fossil fuel companies, again, going back to the environmental change thing, but even just the baby food uh, shortage that happened recently. It's like China had a baby food shortage too, or baby formula shortage, and then they arrested the people who were responsible for manipulating the market for profit, and I think they even executed a few. And it's like, again, that's starting to look more and more attractive to people here in the West as things get more and more dire for people. Yeah, but ironically, basically everything you're bringing up is a failure of centralization, right? So if you look at the 2008 crash in the US, just look at the uh, effect of federal funds rates during this time period or look at the M2 money stock. What you see is what the, the federal government was doing and what the Fed was doing, the central bank, is they were, uh, well, back in 2002, really, 2001, 2002, 2003, um, they were lowering the, uh, um, sorry, the uh, qualifications for loans, probably, right? It, uh, not the qualifications. I'm sorry. The interest rates. That's right. They were lowering the interest rates significantly. Um, they, they took them down from 6.5% to 1%, which is significant. And what happens when you do that, uh, when you just artificially lower interest rates, is that sends false signals, right? So you're changing the money but the actual goods, the actual available materials aren't changing, right? So it causes malinvestment and that's what often leads to um, recessions. And I don't want to go into a whole, we're not, we're not going to sit here and have a debate on the, the causes of the 2008 crisis, maybe another time if we want, but also, you know, the M2, the M2 money stock, you see. Well, I would like to spend a increases. couple minutes on it because I do have some questions for you in that respect, because I can just kind of briefly, if I could explain how I would see it differently is because I, I feel like, you could definitely point to some policies that happened from the U.S. government that you would consider government intervention, that you would consider socialism, that you would consider anti-free market, and that you would say caused that financial crisis and caused the crash. And I would say that those are still the result of capitalism because even in that scenario, the government is enacting policies that were favorable to the capitalists who lobbied them in the first place. If they weren't directly written by the firms themselves, they were at least influenced to the point that let's say it started out as a regulation on the banks that would allow something better for the working class because, I don't know, some liberal politician got it up their butt to like really grandstand and go for the guts of gusto and write like a working class New Deal bill. We all know that like the way politics works, by the time it even gets to the floor for approval, it's going to have the input from every lobbyist, every like wealthy influence that it possibly could, and it will end up being favorable to them in the long run, if not immediately. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't call like a, a central bank capitalist whatsoever. You know, Carl Karl Marx advocated for having a central bank. Like capitalists like myself for years have wanted not wanted that. And if you look at instances where countries didn't have central banks or areas didn't have central banks or or as much central banking, then they didn't they didn't go through all these recessions. I, I think even Karl Marx noted that Scotland during their free banking period didn't experience recessions. So that's what that's what we want, right? Like I recognize that places like the US, which you know, I'm sort of defending in this debate because I'm not I'm I'm not entirely approaching it from the anarcho-capitalist perspective because we're mostly talking about socialism, but you know, I'll I'll defend the US over like the, the Soviet Union, but I still we don't advocate for for a central bank, right? I think that's a fundamentally socialist thing. That's a, that's a thing that almost every socialist when they get in power does. They want to centralize the banking. They want to nationalize the banking. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that is a problem with central planning and a problem with centralization. And then well, another thing that you mentioned, uh, the uh, baby formula, that was pretty much the same thing. Baby formula is an extremely regulated and extremely subsidized markets. And the FDA themselves admitted that they were partially to blame. I would say they're almost fully to blame, but they were partially to blame for the shortage, right? So you had lots of issues like, like banning um, imports from other countries. You know, all these countries are more than willing to import 
to, to export baby formula to the US, but the FDA and the federal government just wouldn't allow them to do this. So if you run into these problems in the US, you know, one of the one of the great things, like how I mentioned in the uh, the grape juice example, right? Some of the people can import it, right? Even if you have domestic issues, like there's specifically domestic problems in production of baby formula, uh, or even, even you can even, I could even say, you know, maybe some people were kind of greedy and they wanted to hike up prices, but when that happens and there's still alternatives, right? Like you can import from other countries or you can go to another business. And that's mm -hmm. what actually de, de incentivizes things like um, price gouging or, or you know, kind of trying to take advantage of people in tough situations, right? So I would say it was entirely the fault of centralization that the well, baby I, formula shortage happened. For me to, to understand your point of view when it comes to be, especially to go so far as to say it's entirely the fault of centralization, I would really have to see some of the particulars as to why, I guess, are you saying baby formula was turned away from other countries or that they could have shipped it, but like they just didn't because it couldn't meet US regulations? Because again, I mean, that really comes down to a lot of particulars and how much of that was caused by baby formula not being able to be imported and how much was caused by artificial scarcity shortages created by the profit couching. You know what I mean? Like, I guess we'd have to probably delve into it deeper than we had the ability to just in here. But I mean, to go so far as to say it's entirely the fault of centralization, it's like, I don't know. It just, it just strikes as odd to me. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm also perfectly fine to just move on to a different thing since I didn't realize how, like, we're going to go for like another maybe 20 minutes. Have we really been going that long already? Yeah, I, my, my opening statement was like 15 minutes long. And then we've kind of, you know, stuck on some of these. That's totally fine, though. But I mean, this has been like really uh, easy to do. I mean, it's been very cordial. I, I've been having a good time. So I'm perfectly fine to do it again, even this week, if you want to pick up. So, yeah, uh, uh, we, we can go back to I'm trying to get this. We can go back to like what we've got over here. Right. So um, and we can <clears> even if you want, like I can make a note to look into Chile and Allende. And... Yeah, I'll send you like everything, like everything that we've talked about where you're like, oh, I'm not really sure about that. I'll send you an article on, on the baby formula. I'll send yeah. you stuff on the CIA involvement, Every everything we've talked about. I'll make sure cool, I send cool. you all that. Um. So this, yeah, this was a good one. I remember this one being cool. The real GDP per capita. Uh, let's see. So Russia with Japanese wedges. So now this was interesting to me. I remember you saying that this was based on a system that projects counterfactuals and is probably, according to you, like the best, the best gauge we have of predicting what would have been differently, like you said, with different counterfactuals, right? Yeah, counterfactuals is something that have historically largely been ignored in mm. both history and economics because you know it is very difficult, right? I mean, a lot of people try to say it. It's mostly something that you hear in common discourse, right? Like people will say, "Oh, well, you know, Russia was much better off uh, because they." Uh, because of like Stalin's five-year plans, for example, right? And that's a tough thing to say because it's like, well, how do you know some of these things wouldn't have happened under the under the SAR system? Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, some people do a similar thing with like slavery in the US. Oh, would we have been better off economically if we never had slavery in the US? Uh, I personally say yes, but that's a very, that was a very contested thing for many years in history and economics. And, you know, there, there's no like real way where you can just say, oh, if we just boop, take it away, now we can see what happens without it. So uh, synthetic control analyses, I think they really came out in, in 2013 and started largely being used. They were something that kind of fixes this, right? They're, not, they're definitely not perfect, but you can you can go on YouTube and find YouTube videos on how they work. And then, you know, in multiple different um, academic journals, you can see um, papers about synthetic control analyses and like tons of academics uh, recommending them and saying, you know, this is something that's, you know, very useful, very important. Um, and so that, that's why I like using them because, you know, um, I was watching a video by Second Thought where he actually talks about Chile a lot. And so this is why I did the research into Chile. But, you know, he says, you know, we can't control for all these variables. It's very difficult. But then he goes on to try to make all these claims without controlling for the variables. It's like, oh, you can't make the claims that socialism is bad because maybe they failed because of other variables you're not accounting for. But then he says, mm -hmm. oh, well, it was good, but he doesn't consider other variables that weren't accounted for. Like Bolivia is a really great example. They weren't super socialist, but you had Morales. And, but shortly after he came to power, you had this huge surge in uh, natural gas, right? And it, it had nothing to do with him, but it caused the economy to boom like, significantly. Um, and 
when it boomed, the natural gas was actually privately owned and then later renationalized it. Um, so like people completely ignore that and they're like, oh, look at this boom. That's because of Morales's social policies. But there's actually similar studies like this that look at his social policies and say, well, no, actually these had a net negative and it was the natural gas that caused the economy to boom and caused, you know, living conditions to uh, improve. So, you know, that's that's why these are so important. So like in this case, they look at Japan because Japan was similarly situated um, in the early 1900s uh, as Russia economically. And they grew mostly on a, a, a market basis, right? And then, of, of course, they're also looking at the SARS trends. And um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what's happening here. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, so my initial response to this when you were reading through it was just to obviously question the validity of like projecting a counterfactual future according to like if the SAR was never overthrown and if they would have developed as well. Because obviously... That's the easiest thing I could quibble with, right? Is to say like, oh, well, this is like some bunk theoretical science. It's like on the level of like uh, even less than like a social science. You know what I mean? But I mean, I could even just grant that like maybe it would have happened just as well under the uh, the SAR or whatever. Um, yeah, I was I actually going to go and like add in like different academic papers specifically about synthetic control analyses and show like oh, this is something that's highly recommended. This is something that's very mainstream. It's not like you know, like you said, some some bunk science or something, but I just yeah, didn't yeah. have the time to do that. I mean, I kind of reserve, I kind of regard all of uh, economics as like bunk science, though, because like the way that we Marxists see it is like when you have people who are studying economics under capitalism, they pretty much act as like the priests of the religion for the elites of that country. It's just to reaffirm, and I mean, not to be insulting, but that's kind of how I consider like all of and cap ideology and like the whole. The thing that you guys are doing it's just like that's how it comes across to us but like again i'm not saying that to like be insulting or like be spicy or whatever it's just like we understand that it's just like stuff that you guys arrive at like i don't know if the word is post facto or whatever it's like but it's after the fact it's like we build this on what has already been done and then describe it rather than like making prescriptions and then going based on those and that's why it results in things like so like the reason i don't go back to like Tsarist Russia or Stalinist Russia is because again, we just look back at it and we recognize that a lot of mistakes were made. A lot of exploitation happened that didn't necessarily need to happen. Um, and that's not even getting into things like the gulags. We understand the gulags differently as like, I was under the impression that they were 10 year max sentences and that people were like fed and housed in like much, not much, but like reasonably better conditions than even prisoners here are in the U S and that it was not necessarily the, um, what do you call it? The powerhouse of economic generation of wealth that even the prisons are in the U.S. today. But again, that, that's just my understanding. Well, it's it's, it's kind of the we... yeah, that's kind of the opposite, right? So prisons in the U.S. prison labor is a net negative, right? So I I'm like totally against prison labor, right? So I'm I'm not going to defend the concept itself, but in the U.S., the amount of outputs that any prison labor produces is significantly less than the actual cost of having those people in prison. So the cost of I would having say that may even be the case, but I would say that kind of makes our case is that the US government is actually using its labor force like its normal tax paying citizens to fund a basically subsidized slave labor program for the benefit of businesses like Walmart and whoever is selling those products that are produced there. Well, in in that case, like it's it's still a net negative, right? The this is just something like you have people. I think any sort of claim that we're jailing people for prison labor is completely unfounded. It doesn't match up with the actual historical trends. It doesn't really make any sense. I, I think, think it's just it's one. It's uh it's a punishment. Two, it's a uh, you know you're you're tr trying to reform people, and three is you're trying to make up a little bit of the uh, a little bit of the funds that you're actually putting into these people. I don't think there's any evidence of actually jail jailing people for prison labor profit in the U.S. But in in the Soviet Union, this is specifically something that they very much wanted to wanted to do in industrialization. They really wanted to use prison labor as like a a. a force for industrialization. And this is something that's very documented in any history book about this period in uh in Soviet economic history. So no, that, I would, that's, I would definitely that's specifically that because, what they like did, said, but we it's have not a, what the US does. Yeah, we, I think we just have very different understandings about both of those situations. And 
I explained mine already. It's pretty much a polar opposite of yours is that, yeah, just the vice versa is that the gulags were an unnecessary uh, measure that was taken and it wasn't necessarily for profit, but that the U.S. prisons grew out of slavery. And I guess I never actually did watch that documentary on Netflix, the 13th, about the 13th Amendment and why it specifically made the, uh, what do you call it, the carve out for prison labor when it outlawed slavery. But I suppose I'll have to for next time. But that's another thing we could just get into later. Since we are at about an hour i would like to can i make like a general final statement and i'll let you make one and then we can call it a night yeah sure so then i guess like getting more like i was saying before how we don't do much apologizing for stalinist russia or war communism or anything like that it's because we basically realized that that method may have worked in some ways for that time period but it's definitely not necessarily what's going to work at any other place in time certainly not something we should dogmatically apply just, you know, blanket wise everywhere. Um, and again, just to reference China's model, like we generally think that they're doing a much better job of having markets at a lower level. But then when it comes to necessities and things like energy, like national, uh, what do you call them? The things that should be nationalized, the things that are utilities, they will nationalize companies. They will put billionaires to death if they find corruption at those levels uh, and if they find it necessary. And I guess it's almost the, like the way I think of it is that Imagine if you had a graph and you have like an exploitation measure on one of the axes. And the more you slide that up and the more you exploit people, it just creates the instability or the conditions for instability. And it may not happen immediately. It may take a while. But if you have to exploit people to build the productive forces of your society that it depends on to create whatever you tout as the successes of that society, whether it's life expectancy, whether it's material returns, or whether it's just pocket change in the citizens pockets and they're able to buy baubles and like little shit that's going to break really quick it doesn't matter if it, if that's built on exploitation you're inevitably inevitably going to create the conditions that lead to that society's downfall and it's usually just a matter of trying to lower the level of exploitation so that you can have like a tolerable society and that's the end goal of communism is to resolve that exploitation conflict and we see like Stalinist Russia as a place that was ramping up the exploitation because it's what it had to do at that time and place. And obviously, like we have a lot of criticisms of even like just the general labor conditions for people in the factories in the USSR, just like we have a lot of criticisms of the conditions even in modern day China and a lot of other socialist countries that we, we would consider doing well. And we would just say that they're doing well given the conditions, like being able to make do with what they're doing at this time and place. And then hopefully because of their ideology, they're moving in the correct direction. Um, and I guess that's, I mean, just to, just to touch on a little bit what that actually looks like in practice when I say like sliding the exploitation lever up, what that looks like and what we point out in like modern capitalist societies while you have things like mass shootings, like the rises in mental illness, the, what would you call the general instability of the US where people are finding it harder to afford things, the rise in homelessness, the decrease life expectancy despite the spending on health care. Um, just any of the things like I'm sure, like you said, you've hung out in enough Marxist spaces or watched enough of our media. Like I'm sure, you know, the things that we tout as the failures of late stage capitalism and, you know, the example, the signs that it's spinning out of control into instability. So that's like my general overall thesis. And we can just keep getting into that hour by hour for as long as you want. Cause I can do this forever, but you can go ahead and say whatever you like, and then we'll call it a night. Yeah, um, I kind of I, I wanted to make a sort of another um, slide about inequality and Marxist exploitation. But, you know, I, I, I rightly recognize that would take too long because, you know, we're, we're over an hour now. Um, but the, these sort of things, I do think I do recognize the Marxist critiques and especially you know, the Marxist Leninist. I recognize all the things they point to. What I say is I think most of that isn't even true at all. There is a lot of real problems. Like, I mean, you pointed to the 2008 crash. You pointed to the baby formula shortage, right? We do see a lot of problems that happen that are are completely real, but we usually see this as a result of centralization. And so, you know, my my idea is, you know, you, you want more privatization. You want things more decentralized. And I think that generally does make things better. And I think there's definitely overwhelming evidence to support that. Um, as far as like inequality goes, I mean, the fact is socialists, leftists, they're usually completely off the mark on that. 
Um, I, I did a video on my TikTok recently kind of going over the data. Uh, if you look at things like income inequality and actually account for different variables like taxes and transfers, what you see is in income inequality since the 1970s has actually decreased. What you see is um, wealth, even wealth inequality, which is an even bigger thing that less people like me know how to kind of review. Uh, when you account for things like social security and things like 401ks and all these other factors that are usually left out of inequality measurements, inequality statistics, what you see is the top 1% share of the wealth remains the same since uh, going back, usually it's from 89 to, to current days, right? So most of these things, I think it's complete nonsense. I think a lot of the critiques of healthcare are complete nonsense. There's a great um, blog called Random Critical Analysis, and he has this a ton of articles about healthcare kind of going over statistical analyses of healthcare and showing how a lot of the common knowledge and things you hear from the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth healthcare and all this stuff are mostly nonsense and don't really hold up. He also goes over you know, life expectancy and stuff like that. And again, I, I recognize there are plenty of critiques. I have tons of critiques of the US healthcare system. I have tons of critiques of how we run, but I think a lot of the leftist critiques miss the mark and they point to things that are issues that don't exist or issues that can easily be solved through um, market methods. And so to kind of finalize this, I'll go back to a few a few things that you, you kind of talked about and that we were just talking about. You know, We have like the, uh, the counterfactuals Right, the actual data methods, which you know, not oh, yeah, everybody. Just, sorry, just real quick, I wanted to ask you if um, this is more of a joke thing, but in their counterfactual projections for what Soros Russia would have looked like had it continued with you know liberal economic reforms, did they factor in the ten-year boom and bust cycles in there as well? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on if they're going to have a central bank or not. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, you know, the, besides the actual data counterfactuals, which we had, I, I gave two. Um, you also have people like Robert Service who made these predictions just based off of the information that they had. Um, so he's a historian. And then there's also a book called um, Faulty Foundations, Soviet Economic Policies by uh, two economists. And they, they kind of basically say the same thing here as Robert Service says. The new economic policy would have been way better. Um, and finally, I can kind of wrap up with like the the environmental stuff the, the climate right because I, I i specifically put this in here about ecocide in the ussr which you know you said you don't defend the ussr to your dying breath and that's good I, i'm happy to hear that but i think I mean, this i'll defend is... a surprising amount of stuff i was already defending gulags but uh... yeah <laughs> um but i think this is something that's very important because we saw in you know basically the uh the big socialist state that that lasted for for decades we saw this being a severe issue and, you know, it was basically the worst polluter in the history of mankind. Um, and largely because of, you know, the, like more than the, the ways US, they allocated More than like resources. even the U.S. military now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, So that's going to be my last closing thing is like, I just think for next time, I'm going to have to look more into some of the specific topics that we discussed for a bit and try to also prepare like a slideshow kind of like what you did, because I think it is a very convincing and it's a good way to present a lot of information more than just giving like general overviews like I've tended tended to do. But um, what was the one thing you were saying about inequality, like actually not being any worse than it was over the last 40 years or in the seventies or whatever. It's like, I guess that's also my overall point. It's like, I kind of hope you guys are right. And I mean, like you guys, meaning like the ANCAPs, like the people who even critically support the U S um, I say it all the time on my show. I hope the neoliberals are right. I hope that they are, you know, going to take over, I don't know, I guess, what's the neoliberal goal is to take over the world under NATO and the EU or whatever, and then slowly make everybody's life better by instituting neoliberal democratic reforms and uh, liberalizing the economies and everything. And I hope that they're right that like, whatever that system comes up with as far as counteracting the environmental damage that it does is enough to actually save humanity. Like, I hope that's the case. I just don't see that being possible but yeah i mean if you want to continue making that case to me over however many nights you want to do it that's great yeah and i definitely take the exact opposite position i hope the marxists are wrong <laughs> well that's um, what i'm saying i do too like it would be it would be great if we were all right actually it's the same position i guess yeah i hope the marxists are wrong um yeah yeah uh we, yeah i would love to go over the inequality statistics um I, I have a lot of great stuff on that yeah so i'll kind of finalize it again with the, with the climate stuff um i think primarily to like what they point out here, what we call the economic calculation problem. 
Um, this leads to a huge waste of raw materials and, you know, the misallocation of resources. And that's a, that's a really a very bad environment thing. And I think um, inherently a capitalist system is much more incentivized to do good for the environment. Um, and even, even in these capitalist systems, when we have these regulations, like we had the cafe standard for cars in the, in the seventies and they're like, okay, we're gonna have these regulations to, to kind of fix the environment. They ended up just causing more problems. Like the cafe standards, they caused more deaths and car accidents. They caused more children to die being run over by cars because, you know, throwing out these crazy standards and trying to centrally plan the production of private companies just ends up with a huge mess. If you're just shooting shots in the dark, trying to solve problems instead of letting the problems be solved through the market mechanisms, I think that always leads to issues. And I'm a firm believer in the environmental Kuznets curve. I think there's a lot of evidence for that as well, which I don't have here. But you know, if we want to talk about climate change in the future, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's that's about it. I think. Um, uh, so as long as you have the economic calculation problem, which I think is my overarching overarching argument here, like shows you know why socialists uh failed in these different studies and why they failed environmentally i think that kind of encapsulates everything i think so as long as you have this it's definitely not preferable to have a socialist economy and yeah so that's it yeah i mean that's as good a place as any to wrap up i'll just say like i said i hope that the capitalists are right and i hope that you know the again we see it as capitalists already capitalism already controls the majority of the world so I would just hope that that starts to turn things around for the better and curbs emissions and pollution and solves the environment and environmental and extinction crisis uh, with the neoliberal reforms or whatever its solutions are. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to, to doing this again. Uh, I appreciate it. it was like I said, it was pretty cordial and pretty easy to do. So uh, just hit me up when you want to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll wrap this up. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, if you're watching on my YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. If you're watching on his podcast, don't subscribe. <laughs> don't watch socialist content, bro. What are you doing? Um, anyways, all right.